Good morning. The fifth Lat Latin American meeting on energy economics perspectives uh, for energy in Latin America and the Caribbean challenges, limitations, and opportunities. Thanks all attendees for their valuable participation. As well, uh, it thanks the International Association for Energy Econ Economics, IAEE, and the Latin American Association of um, Energy Economics, ALADE, for allowing Colombia to be the host country for this important meeting. We also uh, thank EPM. the Center for Energy Innovation and Investigation, CN, for being the main sponsors for the event, and Terpel, HMV Engineers, Antesco, ISA, Canar SAS, the Faculty of Mines of Colombia's National University, Medellin Installations, and the Jorge Tadeo Lozano University for their sponsorship. With this, we begin the plenary session, Electrical Development in Latin America and the Caribbean, Public Utility Service cha uh, Business Challenge and Challenges. Uh, we'd like to invite Mr. Carlos Jaime Franco, a doctor in engineering, who presides this session um, to introduce the uh, presenters to you. We'd also like to welcome Dr. Joisa Caballero Dutra, Dr. David Newberry, and Dr. Isaac Diner, who will be the uh, presenters during this session. Each participant will have approximately 20 minutes for their intervention, and there will be 15 minutes uh, of questions at the end for all three presenters. Good morning. I'd like to invite uh, Dr. David Newberry, Professor Emeritus of Economics of the uh, University of Economics, uh, University of Cambridge, um, and partner of IAWE, to uh, give us his presentation. Welcome. inviting me to such a fine city. Uh, the laws of physics of electricity may be the same everywhere, but the institutions differ, and it's very good to exchange experiences. I've learned a great deal already uh, from listening to presentations at this conference. Uh, now, usually when I'm in Britain advising the government or the regulator, uh, we tell them to look to Latin America, because many of the good models are to be seen demonstrated here. And indeed, we've invited people from Chile and Argentina to, to advise us on uh, transmission planning. Um, but today, I'm going to draw on my experiences, mainly from Britain, but also in Europe, uh, to discuss this problem of what is the future for the utility market. Um, and we start with the what I view as the core problem. Um, in a liberalized market, you have to ensure that you have adequate investment in the right kinds. You also have to make sure that the pricing uh, is viable, efficient, and that can be tricky with low marginal cost plant. Um, the current problems, particularly we face in Europe, is that uh, we are required to deliver a large volume of currently non-commercial renewables, that is not helped because the carbon price is far too low. If we look ahead, uh, the challenges on utilities are to adapt to a rapidly changing environment in which distributed generation and new loads for electric vehicles and heat pumps are, are going to stress particularly the distribution networks. Uh, and so the question we have to ask is uh, what models look as though they're suited to address these challenges. Now, I've said pricing and investment are at the core, so uh, let me give you pricing 101. The efficient price is the system marginal cost plus what is effectively a capacity payment. It's the value of lost load times the loss of load probability. Uh, and the system marginal cost may be set from outside the system or it may be set by the shadow price of water. If you have adequate import and export capacity, then the price can be set from abroad, and that's often very useful indeed, and I'll come on to that. 
Uh, but the question that liberalized, privately owned generating companies have to ask is, will the price that they will be receiving in the market be enough to cover the total costs, the average costs of new investment? Now, in the world in which we privatized in Europe, um, and particularly in the UK, we had high cost fossil fuel, uh, particularly gas fired generation, setting the price. So the system marginal cost ratio of that to the average cost was high, and that was fine. Um, and in that situation, private investment indeed was extremely buoyant. Uh, but we're now moving very much to low marginal cost plant where the system marginal cost can be zero, it can be negative, uh, so the ratio to the average cost is very low and very volatile. Uh, and that, I'm going to suggest, is going to require capacity payments and longer term contracts, and that's where I think Europe needs to look to Latin America, for examples. Uh, but one thing I do want to stress is that just looking at prices is not enough. This is the history of privatized electricity in England and Wales, and the top line is the price in constant terms. Uh, this is the evolution of fuel costs from coal and gas. And you can see what happened in the early period when we had a centrally dispatched pool is the margin widened. Uh, so market power was exercised. Uh, this line here on the right hand side is the um, measure of concentration. This was effectively a period of two generating companies setting the price. The blue line is when we switched from a capacity market and a pool to self-dispatch and energy-only markets. Um, and the collapse in concentration, the movement to very vigorous competition, meant that the price-cost margin essentially collapsed. Um, it did eventually recover, but what I want to point out here is these are the fuel costs and they're extremely volatile. So when you say the prices are going up and that's what consumers worry about, the first question is, well, what's happening to fuel costs? Um, so just looking at prices alone is not enough and unfortunately that's usually what happens when people are looking at electricity markets. Now, the local conditions clearly matter. If we look at the Nordic model, which has been extremely influential in the new market designs we are required to follow in Europe, uh, it has a massive amount of storage hydro, as Ina Hopper said yesterday. Um, it's well interconnected with markets with different fuel mixes. So the prices in Nordpool can be set not by the very low cost hydro, but outside the system. If we look at France, right at the center of Europe, massive quantities of nuclear power, essentially zero marginal cost plant, uh, but extremely well interconnected to fossil generating countries. So again, the price can be set outside the system and imported into France. In Britain, we have extremely diverse and basically fossil um, priced electricity. Uh, we don't have much interconnection, but we're rapidly building it. Uh, and it's a very competitive market, so the pricing there is reasonable. Denmark, massive quantities of wind, negative prices some of the time, but it's extremely well interconnected uh, both north and south to systems which can set prices. Uh, so the strong interconnection is very important for managing that system. Uh, and I work in the single electricity market of the island of Ireland, which is two countries, Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. It's a small system, it's rather weakly interconnected, it has massive amounts of wind, and that really does run into considerable problems in setting efficient prices. Uh, I'll come back to how they do it. Uh, but when we look at Latin America, what is striking is this wonderful resource of hydro, but relatively weak interconnections. Uh, and so that's clearly going to create challenges. Uh, what is impressive if you compare Latin America with uh, a less developed um, Middle East and North Africa market is, um, and indeed the very early development of restructuring and the creation of liberalized power markets. So this is now the dominant form of um, for trading electricity in Latin America. And indeed, I tell my students when I'm lecturing about privatizing the electricity industry in England and Wales, which Europe thinks of as the leader, I say, no, Chile did this long before we did. 
This is an interesting bar chart. The red line ranks the countries and gives their per capita GDP, so the richest country to the left, the poorest to the right. And this shows the share of private ownership in generation. What is striking is there's no relationship between wealth and the degree of privatization. Uh, and you can see that the simple average is 50% by 2010. And most countries were increasing uh, the share of privatization. Not all of them. You can see Bolivia backsliding. Um, the weighted average, of course, is massively influenced by Brazil, so it's less than 50%. Uh, but still, this is, this is a restructured and uh, significantly privatized market. So it is a liberalized market. And the World Bank, which did this very interesting power market structure study, drew a number of lessons from that, which coincide with the lessons we draw in Europe. That unbundling of generation from transmission uh, improves access, obviously, um, and it doesn't adversely impact productivity and financing. And that's important because the usual claim for vertical integration was the benefits of integrating these two. It doesn't seem to have damaged it when they were unbundled. Uh, again, not surprisingly, competition improves productivity. Interestingly, it's lowered prices. That's not necessarily something you would expect. Often prices have been held down too low. Uh, and it improves access, which is reassuring. Uh, independent regulation improves productivity and lowers prices, uh, a very important lesson. Um, and interestingly, private ownership does not seem to um, adversely in the sense of raising prices. Uh, so the messages coming through are very positive and the amount of private investment that has been undertaken in this sector, 38% of total fixed capital formation over this period is an incredible achievement. Uh, so that's uh, the good news, the bad news, or the difficulty is obviously if you are heavily dependent upon hydro, you're also at the mercy of the weather. Uh, and how that man is managed is, is clearly a, an interesting question. This, this just groups countries in terms of the extent of privatization in generation. Um, and it says uh, what's been happening to residential final prices. And I've said that that's not the only thing you look at. It's the price cost margin that's important. Um, but interestingly, the ones with massive privatization on the right um, have had uh, lower prices than the middle in between countries in the middle. Um, right, now let's come back to the crucial question of setting prices uh, and how in particular is the wholesale price set. Now in the unregulated pool we had in England and Wales, the price was set at the system marginal price, not cost, price, whatever the generators said was the willingness to offer. But we did have an explicit capacity payment. In a regulated pool, and Ireland is a good example, um, the offers, because it's regulated, are required to be at short-run marginal cost. And the system operator then sets the price at the system marginal cost. Um, and that model is uh, common in Latin American countries. Uh, my predecessor in Ireland was Ignacio Perez Arriaga, and his imprint I can see in various market designs around the world, and in particular in Ireland. Um, but the point I want to stress is if you set at the system marginal cost, then you do need a capacity payment, and Ireland has one. The model we have in Europe now is an energy-only market, so the price clears bids and offers in the auction platform that we've now created, um, and it's up to the generators to include any scarcity premium they require. Uh, so the kinds of questions that an economist asks are, what is it that delivers efficient pricing? Is it competition? Is it contracting? Or is it regulating, as with the regulated pools? I've said that interconnection has been enormously important for countries with very low variable cost plant. Um, it's also important because it introduces competition into the market, uh, at least until the interconnectors are congested. Um, and the crucial issue that Europe has been addressing for the last 20 years and has finally got to grips with is how do you make these interconnectors more efficiently used? Um, and if you can do that, then the pricing from systems with high variable costs may help the problem of efficient pricing. Uh, and a very good example is Denmark. 
Um, they export their surplus winter wind. Uh, they have a lot of nighttime combined heat and power based on coal. They export that to Norway, get stored in the Nordic battery, then they import Nordic electricity in the daytime. So the prices are stabilized by that wonderful Nordic battery. Uh, but even so, the interconnectors get congested, the price can fall to zero. Now, the way in which the interconnectors are now efficiently used is by coupling all of the markets uh, across Europe. Um, the green area should now extend right the way down to Portugal. So from Helsinki to Lisbon, there's a single market in principle with a single auction clearing the prices subject to the constraints on the interconnection. Uh, and the interconnectors are now efficiently used and as a result the attraction of building interconnectors is increasing and the bottom left hand corner shows proposed plans of linking us to Norway uh, and there are several propositions to connect us again to the continent. That's fine, but Europe faces the challenge of delivering renewable electricity supply, and that increases intermittency. That needs flexible plant if you don't have access to hydro. Uh, and in the past, the way this was delivered was plant becomes older, it's used less and less, but it remains there to deliver peak power. We have now passed environmental regulations, which means that old coal plant has to coal close. What about gas? Well, the price of gas until recently has been incredibly high, and nobody wanted to invest in gas. Uh, so we didn't have the old coal. Nobody wants to build new coal, except a few Germans. And uh, the gas price makes that investment unattractive. Um, why is it unattractive? What about predicting future scarcities? Well, the price of electricity in Europe is now set largely by political decisions on the volume of renewables. And political decisions are unbelievably unpredictable. Uh, and nobody knows how serious the politicians are. And even if these ones are, the ones who are elected next week may be very different. Uh, so it's very hard for a private investment company to justify investing in this volatile situation. Uh, Britain has faced this problem sooner than others. Uh, our electricity market reform, the EMR acronym, um, was enshrined in an Energy Act and addresses security of supply issues and renewables issues uh, given that there is no satisfactory carbon price in Europe. Um, and what it does is introduce capacity payments through a capacity auction. It has raised the carbon price floor in England um, and it's introduced um, contracts to lower the weighted average cost of capital. Uh, so we have now moved to competition for the market, auctions for long-term contracts, auctions for capacity, um, and leave the market to deal with the short-run efficiency issue. Uh, the interesting thing about the capacity auction was the bureaucrats said the price will be £50, and if they'd been able to choose a price, that's what they would have chosen. It came in at less than £20. Auctions are enormously important at revealing what the investors want rather than what bureaucrats think they should have. Um, okay, so the issue there, investment. It benefits from market testing. Leave it to the market is fine if you've got cheap gas, combined cycle gas turbines, setting the price. Then you can leave it to investment decisions. But the moment you're at the margin of low-cost plant uh, and unpredictable future policies, then I would argue you need long-term contracts to finance the investment. Then you have the problem of what about the efficient short-run pricing. Um, are you going to use it, as I think you should, for efficient dispatch, for efficient demand-side response, efficient storage, over the course of the day and trading over interconnectors or is it just going to recover the costs which is very different just setting average costs and that tension is the difference between efficiency and the much more regulated and heavily controlled market um, I think we're going to um, have to wrestle with how we resolve this tension. I don't have time to go into great details. Um, interconnectors can help uh, import efficient prices, but you need to trade over them at efficient prices. Uh, so we have this difficult dilemma. Are we going to have regulated markets? If so, we're at the mercy of regulators and politicians. 
What about the future? And I only have a few minutes to start suggesting some of the problems. Um, we've seen, certainly in Europe, a massive growth of decentralized generation from solar PV panels on roofs, combined heat and power units in commercial institutions, new demands, micro CHP in houses, that hasn't fully taken off, but electric vehicles are beginning to penetrate some markets quite strongly. And heat pumps, um, impose huge demands in the winter periods. And so these all tend to lead to peakier net loads on the system unless those systems are very carefully managed. And there are smart ways of dealing with it. Um, it the regulator in Britain is trialing a large number of very interesting ways of managing distribution systems, uh, time of use pricing, but a lot of that is automatic. So you come home, you plug in your electric vehicle, and the distribution service operator decides when it's going to be charged so that the system isn't overstressed, so he doesn't have to invest in more wires and transformers. Um, the demand side is clearly important. What we've discovered is aggregating is very expensive, um, and finding better ways of doing that is one of the challenges we have. The infrastructure is still needed to deal with peak demand, uh, and that means that you have to pay for the existence of the infrastructure rather than the use of the infrastructure. Or if you pay for the use, you pay for the use at the peak hour. And so that's going to lead to a different pricing model, um, especially for domestic consumers when they become generators as well as consumers. Uh, and the point to remember is you can think of access to the transmission system as insurance, and you have to pay for insurance. So the question is, what is the best and most efficient way of doing it? Okay, let me try and wrap this up. So in the European Union, um, what we need is a lot of very low cost, low marginal cost, but very durable and capital intensive investment. Uh, and that's going to need either credible future prices, which we lack, or guaranteed contracts, which lower the cost of financing them. Uh, we have a 27-state compromise going on, um, which is not particularly stable and certainly not very credible. So uh, essentially every country is looking after its own interests and developing different models of contracts and capacity markets. Um, but what's very clear is improving interconnection with renewables becomes increasingly valuable. So this, this is a very turbulent time for utilities in Europe. Different countries face very different uh, design problems. In Latin America, I would suggest that you have the wonderful resource of hydro. To benefit from that, interconnection is extremely valuable. Um, obviously, you already know all about the scarcity value of water. You already adopt what I think in many European countries we would benefit from, from central dispatch and um, short-run marginal bidding code <coughs> practices. But you do have to worry about periodic droughts. You have to have this insurance problem of how do you pay for the generation which is only used occasionally. And I come back to the big problem of how do you keep the market having its effect of driving down costs with auctions, um, and uh, with that I will wind up. Thank you very much. Time for a couple of questions. Very see Shansi with Mendel Energy. Thank you very much for that interesting presentation. The integration issue, which I think we're going to talk about further this morning. In Europe, it seems to be that places where it works the best is where the political uh, forces are conducive to making these, uh, you know, making investments in interconnections. The countries, the Nordic countries in particular, are very well uh, suited to that model, and they seem to trust each other and so forth. I think in this 
in Latin America, do, do you think that the politics plays a role, or is it geography and, uh, in other words, what is, what, is, what is the barrier to the interconnection in Latin America? Well, I'm not an expert, but I notice it's an awfully big place, and I suspect the distances are quite high. Um, I would uh, also argue that in Europe, politics is pretty important. Uh, the energy vendor in Germany is driven by hostility to nuclear power. There's a lot going on that I think uh, creates difficulties <coughs> trading across borders. I have a question, Edmar Almeida from Federal University of Rio. Uh, recently, Brazil has introduced a regulation to promote distributed generation, mainly solar, uh, and this is not working. Uh, one of the main reasons for that is that um, the distribution companies are not happy with that, and they um, they see the distribution generation as a big threat for their business. So I'd like you to to know if you can uh, do if you know some experiences of convergence between business interest of distribution companies and the penetration of uh, the distribution companies and the penetration of uh, solar or other types of distributed generation uh, options. That's an extremely important question, and a lot of distribution companies are worried about losing the sales base on which they earn their revenue. Uh, and the question is, how do you properly charge for access to the distribution system? Uh, if you just charge for kilowatt hours and a household generates its own electricity, uh, you sell fewer kilowatt hours, so you make less money. But if you charge for the access to the distribution network, which these houses need in the night time, uh, then I don't think there's a problem. So the, the real question is, does the regulator allow the companies to develop a sensible tariff? Okay. Um, We'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Joyce Azharabia. Dr. Joyce is a uh, doctor in economics, the director of the Center for uh, Regulation and Infrastructure of the Getulio Vargas Foundation in Rio de Janeiro and director of ANAEL um, and researcher in electrical policy from uh, Harvard University. Welcome. Thank you. To thank you, the Association, Latin American Association for Energy Economists, to invite me to participate on this relevant event and especially uh, to have the opportunity of sharing some thoughts on such a relevant issue and with such very interesting and renowned people. Forgive me for you know, maybe some doubts in English, but I'll, I'll try to address in English. Um, there is such a it, it is uh, quite a challenge to speak not uh, at first in a panel, especially uh, when you are after uh, someone who has probably already delivered such relevant issues. But I'll try to address the. Uh, challenges that are faced by utilities um, in a region like Latin America. And so um, utilities usually, um, as also mentioned or in some sense questioned recently by Itmar, it, uh, usually embraces and implements some efficiency measures under the expectation that they may be able to appropriate part of these benefits. Uh, however, when we are talking about investments that reduce end use consumption, utilities are more conservative, fearing that those investments will not be recovered through rates, which may negatively impact revenues and margins. 
only during a power crisis when there is a reputational risk, they tend to act aggressively, reducing energy consumption. So we are talking about stop and go efforts. In Brazil, for example, this was the 2001-2002 experience, and in some sense, a similar movement is taking place there right now. So uh, we have already seen some issues related to the future of the electricity industry. We are, you are probably familiar with the fact that the power sector is poised to significant and reversible changes due to some transformations in which the way energy is produced, the way energy is used and controlled, say AMI, two-way communication in the consumer premises, technology uh, as a challenge and as an enable, enabler. So we can have deployment of enabling technologies in the consumer premises. premises. So many of those changes are embedded in the concept of smart grids. We are talking about significant impacts in the industry profitability and in utilities business models. This change will probably impact severely both public and private utilities in an extent that we are already to see. So in this future of electricity agenda, we have usually see two distinct poles. In one pole, we have several discussions on the access to affordable modern forms of energy that is a prerequisite for economic prosperity, for local growth and sustainable development. So we are talking about huge populations without access to electricity more than a billion people. And in the other poll, we have mature economies in, uh, in their electric, electric systems, in which deployment of smart grid technologies has been motivated and discussed by, in some sense, environmental regulations. This is uh, the case in some countries in Europe, in Europe and in the US, for example. And on the other side of this discussion, we have several countries in Latin America that may be characterized as middle income countries where the majority of the population already has access to electricity. Um, and even though some of these countries uh, have witnessed liberalization reforms in the end that started in the end of last century, there are some design problems that undermine the continuous evolution of the competitive markets agenda. This is the case of Brazil. I will cite Brazil because this is the, the experience I'm mostly familiar with and so we have us to understand that maybe we are talking about a reality that we are not that familiar with. So, in general, the situation in several of Latin American countries uh, is characterized by the lack of markets to trade, uh, for example, ancillary services, demand response, and energy efficiency. Uh, there is a push to convert smart meters, and we can see by this figure that Latin America is not the leading this process, but it may be seen or it may be perceived as an opportunity to roll out smart meters in the region in this decade. Also, there is a recent study that is going to be released next week where several institutions in Brazil were invited to uh, develop scenarios about the future of electricity or the, the expansion of the electricity mix. This is uh, a study that has already been developed in Chile and for the case of Brazil, uh, um, there is this technology institute of the, uh, the Army Force 
There is a university, a group of the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. There is uh, uh, environmental uh, linked institutions. But what is interesting to say is that the hydro participation is going to decrease significantly. While, for example, solar and wind technologies will gain, uh, will gain a significant share of this mix. And this is for all the scenarios that were evaluated. So we are talking in some senses of a transformation that presents challenges to a region like Latin America. We, are, uh, we have developing countries that face heavily regulated industries, in fact utilities, um, and that are not in the center of the discussions about the future of electricity. In, these, in several of these countries, regulation can then play a role. It can work, acting as an, acting as an enabler of these new technologies, or it can pose barriers to its deployment. Consumers are in the center of such a process, contracting or getting access to new goods and services. And this may, and this will for sure, allow entry of new players. So the key question is how can one create incentives to the innovation underlying these technologies, not only from the products and services point of view, but also from the business perspective. So we are talking about aligning interests between utilities so that they can deliver some of the benefits underlying these smart grids or new technologies. And then we are talking about a disruptive innovation that can be defined as an innovation that helps create a new, a new market and value network and that eventually goes on to disrupt an existing market and value network, displacing an earlier technology. But when not properly handled, these disruptive forces may threaten the financial equilibrium in traditional industries. This was, for example, the experience of Kodak when G digital photography came in. in. In situations like this, players in an industry must prepare themselves for developing plans and strategies to face these threats offering, for example, new services that are able to create value at competitive prices to face these threats. But so far, the electricity industry did not have to deal with an economic and technologically viable disruptive change that offers consumers a reliable ability to create economic value. I have already mentioned that regulations are may be enablers in the, in, in the context of smart grids, we could have uh, regulations that, for example, some of them are already being discussed, such as the possibility of opting in or opting out, some, some dynamic pricing mechanisms, uh, the relevance of allowing cost recovery, the time frames or the features of the technologies that are going to be um, accessed by consumers. We may have mandates, we may have mandates to achieve energy efficiency improvements or for utilities to spend a percentage of their revenues in energy efficiency or demand side management. We already have in some sense this in Brazil. Funding and payment for energy efficiency could be, for example, on bill financing, the approval of incentives and cost recovery for demand response programs. Sometimes they are exploited, not granting consumers the benefits embedded in it. We may have energy efficiency auctions, and the, the, the point was already that was already mentioned is the decoupling revenues from profits and from sales, in fact. And it's interesting, this is not from, from, Latin, from a Latin American country, but it's from a company uh, in the US that has been working with several utilities in several places. 
and their uh, evaluations is that customers trust the authority more than the government itself. This would certainly apply to several countries in Latin America as well. So, um, we are still in the point of posing questions for the debate. When you're talking about the business, the business models, the question is, will, for countries like, like the ones in Latin America, will we assist a considerable amount of technologies distributed closer to the consumer emerging and that require new business models? And a very relevant question is, could the models that are emerging in Europe and US be applicable to Latin American countries? And when you are talking about the investment models, which new investment, which new growth models may emerge and not only emerge, emerge and be scalable? How can incumbent and emerging players best harness these new investments in Latin America? How can they be affordable? How can they, how can they grant benefits to consumers? This is a very, question, very relevant question. Question, for example, in Italy, smart grids were deployed and without properly granting benefits for the consumers who had to pay for the equipment at their disposal. So we are talking about the existence in these countries of important regulatory barriers. For example, economic efficiency demands prices that reflect the underlying costs. From the Brazilian experience, prices are going in the opposite direction. Distributed energy resources and missing markets to allocate them, this is a very relevant issue as well. We are talking about several regulatory mechanisms that are in place and that do not grant incentives to energy efficiency, for example, or to distributed generation. We have already a regulation for distributed generation and for net metering, and they are still not producing results. Um, and we already have political barriers to decoupling. Because uh, when we are talking about replacing the traditional regulatory mechanisms like price caps and rate of returns for mechanisms like uh, revenue cap, the, a, fair, a fair amount of the population understands these new mechanisms as granting the utilities rent for not producing. So there is the need to better understand this even from the political perspective, this is relevant for several countries in this region. And so, I just would like to pose in the end some food for thought. I think this is where we are at this very moment in the electricity industry. So we are talking about transforming the utility business models. Utilities may play a relevant role in the deployment of smart grid technologies. In, in heavily regulated environments, utilities may adapt, creating value along the whole value chain. This perspective is distinct from solutions or visions about the future of, elect or the future of electricity uh, discussions for utilities in mature economists where the vision is that utilities will become less relevant in the process. So these challenges may be seen either as threats or as opportunities, as always, to adapt or to change to a business model that allows value creation along the whole value chain, incentivizing the distributed energy resources, say demand response and energy efficiency, distribution generation, with economic, societal, and environmental benefits. And it's very relevant to keep in mind that the regulatory framework may be an enabler in this process. Say in a country like Brazil, so it may be, it's not granted that it's going to be. This is not the movement, the movement that we are witnessing right now, for example, in a country like Brazil. 
And so just as a final slide, I would like to, to pose you a, a question. When we are talking about the mechanism design literature in economics, we may be seeking for a new solution and the other relevant question is how can we switch from one equilibrium to the other? So the current situation, for example, in the case of Brazil, is that the regulation of electricity distribution embeds a price cap mechanism, no incentives to share infrastructure. I think this is something that we may learn from Empresas Públicas de Medellín. These incentives are in place there, and the lack of innovation. But what if we instead think about a framework in which regulation may foster the deployment of smart grid, including distributed energy resources with a regulatory mechanism like a revenue cap that incentivizes energy efficiency, where we have the role of an infrastructure provider that can share this infrastructure between utilities for electricity, for gas, for water, and where we have innovation in products and, to the, and in the services that are offered to consumers. Everything understanding the underlying infrastructure, in the underlying framework. So, thank you very much. Hey, preguntas? Any questions? They too, and also what you're talking about with distributed um, generation. Uh, I think uh, a lot of countries in Latin America, uh, like Australia, which where, where I'm from, have uh, lots of sunshine. So something that's happening in Australia, I think, uh, the, with respect to solar, is a very unstable mechanism. So in terms of incentivizing distributed generation, you have this problem that you know we, we charge for network costs just as a loading on the energy price. So, as David mentioned, it means that when households who have their own solar panels are not drawing power from the system, they're not contributing to, to network costs. Worse than that, you pay them a retail price when they supply electricity to the system, so you're compensating them as if they're saving network costs when they're not. They're actually using the network to sell their power. So, I guess my question is, is, is this becoming a problem in some of these Latin American countries too, where you have uh, lots of sunshine? Because you end up with an unstable feedback because the people who don't have solar panels are actually having to pay more and more for the network costs. Uh, it gives people a big incentive to, to put in the panels, uh, to get off the, you know, reduce their, their use of electricity. They contribute less to the network charges, the differential goes up. You have this sort of unstable feedback mechanism. Uh, this is becoming a real problem in parts of Australia. I could see it being a problem here also in some countries where you have very good solar resources. I'm going to talk in the, uh, I'm going to talk about the Brazilian experience. Uh, in fact, uh, I have a co-author uh, who, who is a Brazilian, radicated in Australia, and uh, Flavia Menezes, and we are both writing on assessing the regulatory framework that is in place in Brazil since the 2004 reform, the last one that we, that we witnessed, and so. Uh, uh, the mechanisms that are in place, are currently in place, do not explicitly um, um, address these issues. We are still on the process of um, holding auctions and granting some subsidies that are not transparent, and we are still not working on how the results, if they become an issue, if they gain a greater participation, a greater share, how they are going to be address how they are going to impact utilities. So I think this, this kind of discussion and the one that we are trying to address goes in that direction, that we are going away from mark, market mechanisms and price and proper pricing to embody these technologies.
eh, eh, en 2015, eh, este 2015, there have been some discussions about the agreement for the Paris Paris, and the countries are presenting uh, voluntary commitments. In the case of the energy efficiency in Brazil, is there a certain commitment which includes the distributors, the utilities? What we have in place and that has been in place for quite a while is a mandate to spend and I'm only a mandate for distribution companies to allocate 0.5% of their revenue, the net revenue, to energy efficiency programs. And there is, um, there is a mandate to allocate 60% of this amount to energy efficiency in the space of low income consumers. And what is happening now is that the amount of money of resources that is going to these groups of consumers is not uh, is not granting as much benefits as it's costing so we have uh, net benefits that are negative from this policy that is in place He's a doctor in decision-making science in the area of energy, um, a dean of uh, the uh, uh, vice president of Alade and president of this uh, meeting, the fifth Latin American uh, meeting of um, energy economics. Dr. Binner. It's a pleasure to, to be here to talk about um, issues that are difficult and uh, my preceding um, um, colleagues on the panel uh, have done a, a good job trying to understand it uh, better and try to explain it better. Um, I don't know if I'm going to be accused by Professor Newberry of uh, some of the things I'm going to say because I had dinner last night with him and we were discussing about issues of uh, regarding these um, new energy models and uh, new utility models uh, but uh, we'll see how he reacts to it uh, this is ongoing research uh, uh, there are a number of people involved in the, in this and uh, here is the group uh, the project is being financed by uh, CN and EPM and we're just trying to understand it, to understand the new business models uh, and the background is the following uh, in uh, 2001 or 2002 I published a paper uh, uh, the title of the paper was from planning to strategy and those days we were trying to report and this was published in energy policy and um, we were, uh, you know the issue those days were uh, efficiency mark in markets efficiency prices and everything so now um, my question is are we going back to planning and what what this would be uh, and what is what are the challenges and what is it that we are going back in the same in the same way uh, and so I try to think about it and uh, and some of the and what part of the discussion will be on along those lines 
so there are common discussions as um, what we had in the previous presentators here in this plenary session and um, b even before uh, Professor Newberry started from uh, the liberalization days. But even before the liberalization days, we were in the planning world, uh, centrally planning and centrally dispatched. And um, the excuse or the argument was strategic, this was strategic services for development or for society. And then uh, uh, economists in Britain and uh, elsewhere said, well, uh, we have to think about being more efficient. And uh, markets were created artificially, and um, they, in a way, worked, but we see all the criticism behind it. Uh, everyone is trying to make it work, to get uh, prices down, to get innovation, to get good services, and so on and so forth. And parts of those uh, goals were met, but not all of them. But now, uh, things have changed. Uh, the world is moving in the direction of uh, environmental concerns. And uh, when you are in this position, you are planning. You, you just not said the markets cannot easily solve this, although uh, we, we know the certificates, and all, but they are not working. They are not working and uh, they were introduced in markets and uh, we'll see that the floor for this is uh, not giving us, th th they are not providing enough signals for, for, for investment and for uh, changes. So there is much more uh, intervention from regulators. And in terms of technology, uh, from the old days, we were in the uh, world where you had wood, hydro, oil and coal. Uh, and we started moving to renewables and, and shale shell gas and shell oil. The road has not been smooth. Uh, this has been a bit bumpy. And um, uh, how is this going to evolve? And um, in, there is uh, a period of transition na right now. Uh, and I'm not going to talk only about a period of transition, but uh, the midterm consequences of uh, what's happening in the world. And Latin America, and it's important to understand this, Latin America is slightly different from uh, uh, what's going on in Europe and uh, in the US or in the industrialized world. First, because the technology based in Latin America is not coal or gas or nuclear, but hydro. And um, in this situation, and the, what is not new for us is uh, things to do with intermittency or seasonality in terms of production because coal and gas have been stable and you can predict more or less how much to produce or so on and so forth. And that's not the case when you have hydro in place. And not only because of the seasonalities of, of hydro, but also because of the new uh, that affects uh, hydro supplies every four years in, through droughts, and that has to be incorporated. And, as, and this is important to, to note that uh, people in Latin America have been working on 100 years series, uh, trying to understand and trying to predict from the past. But that's not the case anymore. Because if we're talking about uh, climate change. Is this serious? If, how, how bad is this going to affect the, the, the series of 100 years of uh, 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 data that we have? How much useful? And some people say, well, uh, there is a, a inertia in regarding to this. But uh, complexity in this case would uh, perhaps show uh, 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 that we have to do a big effort trying to adjust uh, what we got in, in, in our historical data. Uh, and there, there is the tension between coal and shale gas, uh, particularly in Latin America, particularly in Colombia. Colombia is a country rich in uh, coal resources. Uh, but um, we don't know. 
Peter Hadley was talking about this yesterday, and uh, he says that um, it doesn't matter how much of a particular resource, shell gas, you got. It all depends on the politics and the social issues. Uh, if you want to extract them, you, it would be... Uh, and I had a talk with Peter uh, yesterday as well, so I'm, I'm getting some of his ideas in my presentation. So this is something that you have to consider. Uh, Brazil has lots of uh, shell gas uh, from his data. Argentina is 